It claims to be 3 million as 700,000, uh, at least there were before <laughs> Christchurch, Plano, and, <laughs> and the Falls and other places sort of took their leave. Um, about 700,000 are worshipping on a Sunday. That's all. That's microscopic. But our brethren from Africa, Asia, and Latin America have come again and again and again to our aid. When they are struggling with poverty, with terrible governments sometimes, with appalling disease, and you don't understand about the hunger in some of those countries unless you've been there. And if you have, it burns your guts and you are never the same again. And these people, their top leadership has come to try and help us. Let's give them a hand. But, although there is much hope invested in the primates meeting in February, do you think that they are going to be able to support any one little group of fragmented Orthodox Christians in America? Of course they're not. They could support, and they might even persuade their colleagues to support, a united alternative to the Episcopal Church of the United States of America, to a basket into which all the different bits could fall. But if we are going to stay fragmented and say, well, uh, yeah, yeah, we've got spiritual unity, but we're going to keep our organization, and you keep your organization, and that sort of thing, they're not going to keep coming back. They're not going to recognize us, and we don't deserve to have them do it. <laughs> got to open our hearts. Go open, our, open our arms and link them. Why do we do it, this division? Well, sometimes it's actually a personal thing. It's egos that have got too big, too big for boots. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am Kephas. This disease goes back to the first century. Jim Packer was talking about it in the first of his sessions. Has Christ been divided? No, but we're divided. What are Christian leaders? When he gets to chapter 4, he doesn't even say who are Christian leaders. It's neuter in the Greek. What are Christian leaders? They're nothing but servants through whom you believe. One plants, one waters. But none of them can give increase. Only God can give increase. And so division based on personal status is expressly forbidden in the scriptures that we claim to believe. Rather, as Paul says, we are God's servants working together. Now, there are beginnings of cooperation at actually a deeper level than we realize amongst the leaders. And that is happening behind the scenes. But it's not happening enough and it's not happening fast enough. So may I say to you, my brothers and sisters, do everything to foster it. Some of our divisions uh, don't come from personalities. They come from significant but second-order issues. The issue of women's ordination is one. The issue of who is a proper recipient of baptism is another. The issue of predestination and free will has erupted again, as it does every hundred years or so. But friends, don't fall out over issues like this. You get both predestination and free will running within the riverbanks of Scripture. They're both there. That's why the debate has gone on so long. Because both people can see it there in Scripture. They're both in the same verse. John 6, 37. 
All that the Father gives me shall come to me. Well, if that isn't predestination, I'd like to know what is. But whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. It's the second half of the verse. And if that is not free will, I'd like to know what is. I tell you, my friends, I'm a Calvinist when I'm on my knees. I'm a Calvinist about tomorrow. I say, Lord, I do not know who you are going to bring tomorrow, but I know you're going to bring some. Sock it to them, Lord. I'm a Calvinist on my knees. And then when I get up to preach, I'm an Arminian. I say, whoever thirsts, come to the fountain. And that balance of holding not one extreme nor the other, nor even a mixture between the two, but holding both extremes firmly at the same time. You'll never be able to fully understand it this side of heaven. But you need to do it if you're going to be true to Scripture and if you're not going to um, rubbish your brethren who are, uh, who are onto a slightly other side of it. So how are we to handle these disagreements on secondary issues? I guess sincere repentance for all that's wrong in Michael Green. Before I start pointing my finger at others. Remember, you point a finger at somebody, three fingers point back at yourself. There needs to be sincere humility for sides of the problem that I have not seen. There needs to be sincere partnership in mission with those who may see things and do things a bit differently from us. Thank goodness we're not all the same. Wouldn't it be boring? The God who made so much difference in nature has made so much difference in grace. And we're to revel in it and to rejoice in those who are different from us. Let me give you an example. A report from Baghdad by the Anglican chaplain there, Andrew White. He writes, The previous incumbent, incumbent of the place where we work, Saddam Hussein, built us a wonderful baptistry. It may have been a swimming pool for him, <laughs> but it's perfect for us for baptizing people. We also baptize the children in a red washing up bowl. In the days when I wasn't living in a war zone, we used to have questions asked about whether you baptize children or adults. Now we have no time for that kind of thing. We just do it. Brothers and sisters, we are operating in a war zone. There is a war for the heart of America and Canada going on. Ed Hurd's book is very useful on that topic. And we're in the front line, and there we are bickering about infant baptism or adult baptism and all this sort of thing. It is it's a good discussion, but this is not what the spreading of the gospel is all about. This man, the chaplain out there, has had all 11 leaders of his Alpha course being killed in the past year by insurgents. And yet the gospel grows. Guess where the Alpha Course meets now? It meets round Saddam Hussein's cabinet table. And that's the power, the costly power of the gospel of Jesus Christ when its ministers really unite with one another in mission. Could we open our hearts like those first Christians? Could we first of all repent of our part in division, our pride, our harsh words about others or other organizations, our uncooperative attitudes? So we've all done it. Could we repent before we leave here? Could we pray with all our hearts for the primates gathering in Dar es Salaam in mid-February? as they face probably the most difficult and most critical issues, certainly since the Reformation. And these men have an incredible burden 
on their shoulders. We need to lift them in prayer because it is crisis point in the communion's history. And thirdly, could we try every one of us to be people of peace and partnership, not partisanship? Going across all those stupid man-made divisions which sometimes we bewail and often we rejoice in in our local communities. You know, often new life springs from the bottom up. Have you noticed that? Uh, in Britain, it's very interesting. When the World Council of Churches had more or less uh, packed up having any, any influence and all the local manifestations of it had died, <laughs> the local Christians started getting together. And now, all over the country, you've got trans-denominational groups, uh, many of them celebrating Jesus. It's from the bottom up. Sadly, the top-down efforts of church leaders have run into the sand. Let's be part, all of us, of the Unity in Mission Brigade, working from the bottom up. Wouldn't that be great? Couldn't we see something really coming in our society from that? I came in and sat next to somebody this morning and we got chatting afterwards. He allowed me to say this. He is a church planter working with AMIA. But guess who his supporters are? They come from the Anglican Church of Canada, uh, of Kenya rather, the, the, the uh, uh, American version of it. They come from Accuser. They come from the network. They come from Reformed Episcopal, as well as from AMIA background. Isn't that glorious? That's what we want to see. To heck with the labels. Let's get our act together to celebrate Jesus, to build people up in the Christian life, and to ensure that from bottom up there is a clamant cry which nobody can shout down saying, we are together and we will prevail. That is a calling for each one of us as we contribute our particular gifts that God has entrusted to us. And so, folks... We're called to enlarge the place of our tent by apostolic methods with open mouths, open minds, and open hearts. Do not hold back, says Isaiah. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Like Carey long ago, attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. And then the prophet predicts, you will possess the nation's and you will people cities that are desolate. And the inner cities all over the world are desolate places. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have the different colored flowers of Bible-based Christians reveling in the power of the Holy Spirit, united, arm in arm, flowering in those desolate inner city places. If I begin a thing said Carey, I must go through with it. Amen? Amen. So be it.